you know, just to set some context, um, this is a photo of Albert Einstein and uh, a man named Walter, I forget his last name. Uh, he, this is from 1933. Einstein was a visual thinker. He was actually notoriously bad at math, uh, like mental math. And so he had this man follow him along and sit with him at the beach, and he was his calculator. That was his job title. Um, so Einstein would think of some something, and he would pass it on to him, and he would regurgitate uh, whether the, whether the uh, formula made sense. And so, you know, our access to intelligence has obviously come a really long way since the 30s. Now we have, you know, storage and atlases and maps, and you know, literally they're sitting on a beach, but now that sand has turned into silicon wafers. Uh, Basically, and, and these tools are starting to accumulate really rapidly, and they're tools that are available both to you know large companies that produce them, but also really rapidly diffused to individuals. So, uh, you know, one of the things I say in my my series is like the in a, in short order that in, ordinary Americans will have more sort of capabilities than CIA agents do today, um, which is amazing and, and a little bit nervous at the same time. So the reason we're AI is in the news and what, what makes it uh, this year, this past year so special is we sort of realized that, uh, some clever person realized that our AI is that we were using for classifying images, you know, passing pictures of dogs and cats and having a guess. We literally just turn that around and make the input the output and then put the word cat and generate an output of cat. So there's a lot of discussion around generative AI as being something new, but really generative AI is same AI we've always been using, but being used in a new way. What makes today's AI different is scale. Uh, scale and better architectures. Architectures are more efficient, so you, that you can scale. Um, so, you know, this this uh, this image of Trump and Obama playing uh, playing hoops. Um, the first and second, but that's one year of progress. Uh, we went from. Jackson Pollock's and uh, uh, weird surrealist nightmarish <laughs> image generation to to uh, something that looks almost photoreal, and just doing that because of scale uh, and this idea that more is different. Um, you know, I often hear you know, AI is nothing new, and I agree that AI is nothing new. You know, the first perceptron goes back to 1953 or something like that. But what is different is the scale, and scale is goes from quantitative to qualitative. Um, and the scaling is incredibly predictable, right? So across compute, the number of parameters in the model, and the amount of data used to train those models, there are very smooth uh, learning uh, test loss curves that show how the model gets better and more performant the bigger you make it. And that's letting us, you know, that, that's one of the sources of a lot of this fears around AI, is not things that necessarily exist today, but things that will exist in a few years, given the pace of, of doubling and exponentials. Um, so what makes today's AI different is we went from, you know, things that could just classify images and uh, recognize faces to things that actually learn to generalize, right? The only way MidJourney can produce that image of them playing basketball is because somewhere in its layers, in the hidden layers of the neural network, are representations of what it means to have your body configured in a particular position. Um, broader, more abstract concepts like point guard. <laughs> um, and and so, so it's important to realize that this isn't just copying and pasting. It's learning the deeper general principles, the deeper representations, and then building up on from those into things that are totally novel. And then, you know, as a glimpse into the near future, model size is ramping up really quickly. So uh, GPT-4 is still, after a year out, Kind of amazing, the best performing model for language, and the based on leaks, the approximate uh, compute that went into training GPT-4 was 10 to the 25 flops. Those are floating point operations. These these models were basically trained by doing gigantic matrix multiplication, matrix math, um, and so they basically had to multiply a matrix 10 to with with 25 zeros after it <laughs> times. Uh, over the over the course of months with giant supercomputers, and um, you know we have Gemini coming out probably this December from Google that's rumored to be about five times the size of uh, GPT-4, 
and then there are, are models in the works that will be next year, multimodal models that are 1,000x bigger, right? And so if you've seen the way benchmarks jump from GPT-3 to GPT-4, where suddenly it went from failing the Barbican to being the ninth percentile, it's going to be really interesting to see what comes up next year and what, what new, new things uh, emerge. Um, but given the fact that those compute curves are very predictable, the, the ones that were going down earlier, and that our forecast of the amount of compute we'll have, the, the, the continuation of Moore's law, the uh, compound growth of data centers, you can make a, a rough sort of guess of when we will have the compute and the, the algorithms available to essentially model any any given input-output behavior. Um, and so Epoch AI is a, a group that does some of this forecasting, and they have what they call the direct approach model, which is putting putting these variables in, hardware improvements, software improvements, the amount of compute, uh, the, the scale of, of uh, our hardware. And so, and so they use that to generate an estimate. Like, when, when will we have models that could, in principle, essentially brute force something that is human level. Um, human level in the sense that the input of behavior is indistinguishable from, from human. Um, so this gets at the, so, so there, there's our current median forecast is around 0.9. That doesn't mean that these things come alive and wake up, but it does mean that many things that we think of as hard to reproduce by a computer um, will, will collapse and become very easy, easily reproduced. And, my mental model of how that looks is is in context learning. So these models uh, they can do many different things, but they, they work really well through future out learning, where you present a few examples, and then it's like as if the weights in the model all reorient themselves to trying to reproduce those examples and learn learn what your what your your process is. Um, and so in in context learning, in the future may look like something running on your operating system or or something literally sitting over your shoulder. Kind of shadowing your job <laughs> for for a day or a few days, and then being able to sort of pick it up and pick up exactly what what kind of job you're working on and the kind of workflow you're using. Um, and so for them, they they try to benchmark this to the ability to produce a, a original scientific manuscript, um, and they have an estimate of how much how many tokens that would need and and point point nine is roughly when that happens. But that, that's also you know that's not one thing stop. That's that's just a a potential uh, turning point. Um, so what makes this kind of exciting is just this realization that prediction is understanding. If you can predict something well enough, you have to know something about it. Um, I think we've all, points in our life, crammed for an exam. <laughs> Not uh, and, and you realize, you know, that the day after your graduation, all that information that you crammed in during college is just gone. That's because we were memorizing. <laughs> We were learning that you know supply curves shift out and demand curves do this, and there might be some problems. Uh, but if you really understood the, the material, then you would generalize. You would be able to be presented with an exam that you didn't have the presets for, that you weren't were cramming for the night before, and be able to pass that as well. And there's a very similar thing working with these models. Early in the state training of large language models and other kinds of models, it's easier for the model to memorize things. And this is what, where we get the notion that ChatGPT is just a parrot. It's just a mix, mixing and matching and combining things and regurgitating. And there's certainly some of that. And if you want to parrot, you can. But as these models scale up, they do something different. At some point, memorization transfers into generalization, where with enough examples of all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, or for Socrates is mortal, they don't just learn to memorize that, but to understand that there's a, a logical core that can be applied in many different areas. Um, and it makes sense why this would be a more efficient representation as well, because if you store the representation of like a logical syllogism, then you don't have to store it a thousand times. You can store it once in the model, and every time you have an example of a logical syllogism, you can reapply it. Um, uh, and so you know, this is sort of showing the best way to, to understand the world is, is to predict it. And if, if there's anything that's predictable, uh, these models will not just be able to predict it, but in some sense learn the representation with a deeper meaning. The natural language processing world and academia is kind of in crisis right now <laughs> because natural language processing used to be like a dozen different subdisciplines. There are people working on parsing, people working on um, semantics and classification, 
and all these different syntax, you know, all, the, all these different subfields of trying to learn how to use AI and language. And then along comes large language models and just it, it, it does it all, right? Just one model uh, can classify, can parse, and summarize. You need it for sensitive uh, analysis. Early when ChatGPT came out, there were there were reports that um, hedge funds uh, they, they took a basket of, of goods and, and uh, of uh, stocks and compared it to hedge fund returns. And well, all they did was ask ChatGPT to read a headline of the stock and say whether it should go short or go long. And they would use that to update the basket. And it actually beat the hedge fund by like four <laughs> percent. So that I I wouldn't recommend doing that strategy now because now all the hedge funds are probably doing something like that. And so so the alpha is, to, isn't there anymore, but it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, and obviously, the reason this group exists is because we can also apply all these techniques and, and capabilities in the legislative process. So if you have incoming um, information or, or if there's a big, a big bill and you want to figure out what in this bill belongs to my committee of jurisdiction, that's a classifier would do that. And you could go and code up a classifier or large language model can act as a classifier for you. It can parse things. Uh, you know, recently the federal government released their use of the, their uh, spreadsheets of where AI is being used in government, and Marcy had to go through and go through all the PDFs and parse them <laughs> into, <laughs> into spreadsheets. <laughs> right. So a cloud of language model, you just dump the PDFs and it will parse that out and put it in a readable format. And so really at this point, the like, government just had an excuse to like be still loading things in PDF because they could, they could have a workflow where they make the PDF and they also have some junior employee running through quad and, and five minutes later they have it uh, in something that's readable. Then you have sentiment analysis, like the very you know, huge, huge numbers of applications for that. Uh, but imagine if you could take all that incoming mail and, and sort of do more advanced form filtering where you're filtering for the actual, is, is this just person ranting at me or, or, or what have you? Um, there's also this, this myth that the, the, the phrase, the weight of public opinion, sort of comes from um, Congress back in the day where they literally stack up letters from, from constituents. Um, today, today it's not really clear, like the, the sheer volume of mail you get is actually an indicator of what people believe, but what you could do is start to you know, build a, 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 set of cat, a, a set of sort of sub bins or subgroups of different kinds of sentiment. Is this, is this letter favorable, not just favorable or disfavorable to the bill in question, but um, you know, what's the intensity of their opinion or uh, yeah, more, more, more subtle sort of views rather than just yay ye or nay. Um, editing, drafting is obviously huge. Translation, I mean, people in America speak many countries, but we also speak different ideologies. And I, and I find that uh, one of the really useful things that I use when, I, you know, when I'm drafting things with large language models as a, as a sort of a research assistant is to say, how would I take this argument, this piece of text that I just wrote, and rewrite it for a progressive audience or rewrite it for a conservative audience and try to see how the different framings, uh, how, the, how the model thinks to frame those things differently. Um, and, you know, we obviously are often in our ideological bubble, so it can be really, really powerful, as a, even as a form of gut check or self-critique. Self um, you know, as, as kind of quasi-programs, uh, one of the things, if you sort of pair these classifiers and analysis, this, this, this sort of semantic understanding, you can also build triggers. So, um, you know, sort of like more advanced Google views. You know, the, the, if, if somebody doesn't just uh, mention a word, but, but uh, refers to, to some broader uh, concept, you don't have to th therefore go, go through and build a Google or every single one of those like potential words. You could, you could have a, a semantic thing it's looking for, like anyone talking about the Jones Act or something like that. And instead of having to have Jones Act and then, and then suddenly, you know, Paul Jones introduces the Jones Act and so it's a, it's a false trigger, <laughs> it, it will find the thing that, it, that you really need. Right, because it's, it's looking for the broader context of the deeper meaning. Um, and then if you start learning, this is, I think, the, the, uh, the most powerful thing about this is any, really any process that you, you're doing that's repetitive, uh, but with like small tweaks, 
just give these models a few examples. These models do hallucinate if you just ask them to write you a novel from scratch. But if you're giving them examples, they're, they're incredibly reliable for summarization and for taking that example and, and repeating it. And then as we're learning, I mean, this is, it's just sort of uncanny the way that large language models um, think in a way that's analogous to the way at least I think. Um, because, you know, we often hear that you know, we can't do four digit arithmetic, but I can't do four digit arithmetic. <laughs> I can do it if I have a pen and pad, because then I can write down the numbers so it's stored in my memory. Working memory is limited. It lets me do the long division, which sort of execute, execute the little algorithms you learn in, learn in grade school. And these models work similarly, so they, they work much better when you ask them to think step by step. Or these more elaborate things called chain of thought prompting, where the model is sort of going down a decision tree and, and thinking and reasoning in steps of, you know, you know, don't just ask it to write you or draft you something, ask it to first outline what you want, what you want it to draft and to break, the, break it down to steps and then let it run. And then it can always refer back to those steps and keep that in its memory. And then these things will are getting better when they when they work in teams. Or well, first when they have access to tools, obviously. So um, you know, ChatGPT has all these plugins. I, I think it'd be amazing to have you know, like a congressional version of the uh, ChatGPT plugin uh, store where you, where you have you know coming out of these AI yeah, hackathons and stuff like that. Um, a bunch of different things that get vetted and put into these plugins. And so when there are common infrastructure that everyone is using, that there could also be common plugins and kind of plugins for to use for pulling the classifier and pulling the, the sentiment analyzer, the thing that you want to use in your, in your workflow. Um, and then mixture of experts. So we're, you know, AIs work better in teams. And this, this also has implications sort of over time as the cost of running these models come down. Because you might think that, uh, you know, the fact that GPT 3.5 or something like that is pennies on the dollar, a fraction of a penny uh, per inference. You can generate a page of text for like a few cents. Um, that seems cheap, but when that becomes, you know, one millionth of a cent, then you can have these models not just running once, but running thousands of times in, in, in microseconds um, and critiquing each other and giving each the models feedback, um, you know, Dividing and conquering different tasks, um, and so even if the technology sort of grows today in terms of sheer capabilities, as it becomes that, that cheaper and cheaper to run these models, new functionality will open up. Um, and then you sort of combine these things: you have the thinking step by step, the access to tools, and then these mixtures of experts sort of ways of subdividing the task. And then you can start to build uh, more sophisticated systems where it's not just regurgitating. Or not just generating text, but the, the, the text generation, the large language model becomes a kernel of a, 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 a sort of a world model, a semantic kernel that understands things and then can be linked with um, models and storage for, for, for retrieval um, and then plugins, and then those all sort of combine into whatever the task that you're working on. So, this might be the congressional office of the future. You know, today we're all sort of working. Um, on ad, ad hoc things and um, very excited about the different kind of tools that you use. But if you think about, you know, taking that, that sort of architecture I showed on the previous slide, every one of these sort of areas of workflow will one day be connected, sort of have AI nodes in between, in between them. So you have incoming emails from, from lobbyists, from advocates, from uh, people from your district, what have you, and you have systems that are automatically doing sentiment analysis on those, automatically uh, sorting and filtering them, prioritizing them in a way that no system has been able to do before. You know, you, you can actually ask these models, here's here's 50 emails, which one seems most important, right? How do you program something for most important? That's a very abstract concept, but these things can do a decent first pass. And you have outgoing, you know, uh, customizing, uh, Replies to to, uh, to the recipient. You know, you, you, uh, sometimes the think tanks where they have like different kind of donor bases. They'll have people who like code up different mailing lists so that um, you know the the Trump fans at the Cato Institute don't get all that stuff for open borders, <laughs> vice versa. Um, and so you, you, that's something that used to require you know in really real in-house uh, 
programming capability, and now now we're just going through the various things you're going to follow. Um, so I sort of imagine this sort of ingoing, outgoing, in, this input output combined with the things that you do on a daily basis from comps and policy and strategy, all sitting on top of a layer of uh, uh, common knowledge, be it the, the, the congressional record, the calendar, um, uh, the US code, and the code for regulations. And then that further sitting on a, a data layer where different offices can talk to each other through that, through that data exchange layer. Not just sharing information, but potentially sharing actual computation, sharing the ability to, to process things. Uh, and ideally in a way that's you know, cryptographically secure and, and not hackable. And then finally, like these things all can plug into the, the, the kind of existing intelligence, the existing internal think tanks we have in Congress um, and have, have this kind of virtuous feedback loop. So with all this is context, like some things get are going to get much easier. Uh, so we, we so for example, data standards and interoperability, today we see that as, as a sort of barrier to implementation. Um, but these models, as they get more general, there are also technologies for modernizing how we modernize, right? Because suddenly you don't need everything to be an XML or some uh, very specific data standard where sort of like USB-C, we all have, to have the exact same port to go and talk to each other. Um, instead, you can have variation and have a layer in between that's translating between that, those different data standards. Um, you know, re reporting requirements, this is, a, this is uh, has, has you know, pluses and minuses. Often um, in Congress, we want to saddle an agency or, or, or some, somebody with a reporting requirement because we, we want to slow it down or something like that. Well, it's not, that stuff isn't going to work anymore because these things uh, could be automatically generated. But it also means that we could just do more of them. Right? Maybe there should be automatic reporting requirements where, um, where you know, a human still has to look at it, but you can get a very decent first draft. Uh, you know, Oversight and accountability, this, I think this will be an er a big area for where Congress is uh, not just modernizing itself, but modernizing government in a way that makes congress congressional oversight and accountability uh, uh, responsibilities easier, right? Because instead of having to, um, you know, pull uh, agency heads to testify every now and then, or like waiting 180 days for the report, you could have things that are continuously mon monitoring their output And then legislative drafting. I've, I've heard rumors that Ledge Council is getting way too many uh, <laughs> way too many bills already drafted for hallucinations and stuff. And you know, and as Congress is doing this internally, there's also just going to be an already this explosion of open source tooling uh, that people are building externally that that are now going to supercharge your work as well. So, um, you know, before FAI, I was at the Scanning Center where we did a lot of stuff on tax policy, and one of our secret weapons was. Me and my, my research assistant Rob, we had a gaming computer that we got our, get the, our, our boss to buy for us. And <laughs> it was big enough that you could crunch, do major micro simulations like within an hour or 24 hours sometimes. Um, and normally, if you're doing like tax policy, you may have an idea of, you know, I want to increase this tax credit, decrease this tax, whatever. And you can go to, um, you know, the Urban Institute will do some modeling for you. There's places like ITAB or Tax Foundation. Um, first of all, you need to know the people there. Second of all, there's a huge, you know, they have limited time. There's a big turnaround to get those estimates. And third of all, once you have those estimates, you're like, oh, I wanted that tax credit to be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. How would that change things? Um, and then you have to repeat that whole loop all over again. And so when I was in the scan, one of our, you know, one of the ways we, we were effective was because we could turn around um, tax analysis so quickly, uh, people would come to us directly rather than have to go through sort of older, uh, older think tanks and institutions. Um, and now, that those barriers fall even, even further where there, there's open source tools like a policy engine, um, this is just as one example, where you can go in and describe a tax reform you want to make, and it will use its open source simulation of the economy and, and, and also use GPT-4 to generate full analysis and report with charts and graphs, with effective marginal tax rates and benefits lists and everything else. Um, so that's another substitute for eventually going to CBO, but it's also some way, way you can sort of get a grasp of a policy early on um, and iterate on it. So this goes to feeding in a little bit to the, 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 
the more abstract writing that, that Marx sent you all. Um, you know, in economics, we learn that institutions are shaped by transaction costs, which is just an umbrella term for the cost of search information, for bargaining, uh, coordination costs, and then you know, monitoring enforcement costs. So you know, this is why we have corporations in the first place. Um, because some things you can do in the market and some things you want to bring inside the company or inside the organization. So you can monitor what people are doing easier, so there's sharing of information with the water cooler and so forth. And so as these costs contract or, or, or change, the, the nature of our institutions also change. Um, and if you think about it, AI is direct, it directly affects all of these. So you could, you could argue the internet had some impact on search information, making search information easier Wikipedia. Um, it had some some impact on bargaining. Maybe you had Uber. Um, you could have eBay. Uh, policing and enforcement, similar to Amazon, would have its own uh, you know dispute resolution systems and so forth. But AI is really going to change. It flaps all these costs like in a, in a dramatic way, right? Yeah. You know, you've heard of like the principal agent problem in a company. Um, you don't have a principal agent problem with, with AI. They they don't they don't shirk. They don't steal money from the sale. <laughs> they'll do exactly what you say, and they'll do it all, all day long. Um, and so some some things that we're already seeing, um, you know, Call of Duty is introducing AI to moderate voice chats, right? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if you ever had, uh, were, were uh, a kid playing Call of Duty, <laughs> or, or have, have kids who play Call of Duty, but the, the, the lobby where all the 12 year olds are screaming at each other, uh, screaming obscenities, like that, that's, uh, that's going to go away <laughs> because um, you don't, you know, and it's not just having to have something that recognizes particular bad words, but potentially particular whole areas, right? Whole, whole, whole sort of topics. Um, there's a growing trend on YouTube now where you, you, you get dinged in the algorithm if you talk about things like suicide or, or the coronavirus. And so people use euphemisms. They'll say people were unalive rather than were murdered. Um, those those tricks are not going to work anymore because these models understand semantics, understand meaning, you don't, not just particular words. Five minutes. Okay. Um, uh, the second one, AI, courts to trial AI and draft rulings. This is from from Taiwan. Um, they uh, they are going to be using AI to intake information. I think I think they're starting with like DUIs and certain low level drug offenses, um, and automatically output. Uh, actual rulings, <laughs> pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and then you, you know, you're, you're, you know, small initiatives in government like IRS is using machine learning more and more to, um, to help its enforcement mission. Uh, but this is going to be something that uh, really, I think, like a tidal wave into our, into our institutions and affects everything. And the reason that, for that, because you think about it, what is a bureaucracy but a kind of fleshy API, you know. Uh, there are people in, in government who are sort of at a high level making abstract judgments, and there are people in government who are, um, you know, there's, a, there's actually a mine in Pennsylvania uh, that was retrofitted for the Social Security Administration, where every morning buses go down into the mine, and as far as I can tell, they mostly just print up PDFs and then scan PDFs and then print out other PDFs. Um, so, you know, to the extent that this is going to be a pedal wave on the civil service, uh, I think it's something to really think about and prepare for. Uh, and, so, and, and one of the reasons it's going to be, I think, relatively quick is because the implementation frictions are, are, are much lower. You don't have to go to IBM and spend a bunch of money to, to consultants to build you some bespoke thing that doesn't really work very well. Microsoft's the biggest IT vendor in the U.S. government. Every computer is running Microsoft Office. When you know you get approval to turn on the 365 Copilot and you have GPT-4 in, in Excel. In Outlook, in Teams, down the line, um, the procurement issue here is not it doesn't exist. It's going to it's going to be there to turn on um, if you want it. And so you you run into sort of scenarios where oh, it's the monthly jobs report, and BLS is you know pulling the data and has to write a little report about the employment situation. Um, at some point, there, that person is going to show up and just press a button, <laughs> and so there's going to be that doesn't mean that um, there's not more work to do, but it means that there could be some redivision of labor and the things that the AI currently current can't do well. And so some examples, um, I have a friend in the FTC's healthcare division, it's a 30-person team of attorneys, 
they're charged with overseeing the entire pharmaceutical industry. And I was trying to get a sense of what his day job was like. And, and right now he's subpoenaing a pharma CEO um, and having to go manually through 40,000 emails to find evidence of, of uh, misconduct. And you know, I think today, you know, you could take those 40,000 emails and put them into Quad 2 or something in the big enough context window and just literally ask, what are the five most egregious examples of misconduct? <laughs> and it might not get everything, but it will get, it will save you a lot of time in finding the, the, the worst cases and you can run it multiple times and, um, and guaranteed big law is doing this, right? Um, there's a company, Harvey AI, that's a partner of Chief Chesh Kuti or OpenAI, um, and they have a billion dollar contract with PwC. And so all, all PricewaterhouseCoopers associates have GPT-4 running as a co-pilot and learning the law, learning accounting, um, and, and fine-tuning those models. Um, and so if, if that's going to be in the private sector, the government needs to be adopting these tools too because it is going to be a, a, an arms race. Um, so as an example, so starting, starting on, the, on the right, this is from a recent GAO report on, uh, for tax enforcement. This is a, a network diagram of a limited partnership with more than 20 tiers. This company may only have like three or four real employees, but they'll, they structure it into this giant complicated partnership because it becomes impossible for the IRS to audit. Um, and if you read the fine print, it says in 2002, there were 36 of these partnerships and they were 1% of all partnerships. And in 2019, there were 6,000 and they were, uh, uh, over was it over 30 percent, 31.1 percent of all our partnerships. Now, now look something like this, and this is actually like the simpler ones, <laughs> right? And the reason this has happened is over the last 20 years is because the internet and falling, you know, information and costs have enabled people to build these complicated things, meant to basically hide what they're doing, um, and so we we're going to need AI just to sort of, you know, tread water. Right, to, to, to stay in place. And then on the left, this is from a, the Semiconductor uh, Association's Decadal uh, uh, Strategy Report. And the, the curve going up is how much data measured in bits is coming in from sensors, from, from your car sensors, from your doorbell camera, from everything. Um, and the green line is the total throughput of human sensory consumption. You know, how much data can we bring in? And so we've already passed what humans can, can ingest, and it's only going to go up from here. And so this, this is going to require a, par a paradigm shift in how government in intakes and processes data, because there's just too much of it. Um, so how often do you think about the Roman Empire? I don't know if you've seen the meme going around where I guess all guys think of the Roman Empire once a week or something like that. Um, uh, you know, the US government is built on institutions and technology from the last century and sometimes very early in the last century. So, you know, we have nine digit social security numbers uh, from 1935. The APA dates from 1946. The IRS master file, which is like the thing that runs the tax code, is written in an assembly from the Kennedy administration. Um, and there's been efforts to try to migrate it, but uh, they're, they're so far stalled. Hopefully, that now you know, we have money, maybe a little bit. Um, so all these sort of firmware level aspects of government, I think, need to be leveled up to be brought into the 21st century. So we hear a lot of talk about like, do we need a new federal agency for AI? And I would, I'm going to be agnostic on that and say, what we do need is new federal agencies, <laughs> like across the board, like existing existing uh, authorities uh, are going to need to get their firmware upgraded. And so that's everything from procurement and uh, new hiring authorities to bring in people with the technical, technical expertise to implement the systems. Um, things like e-discovery, uh, you know, my fear is that next year someone will build the, the, the super reliable FOIA GPT, and then everything that is FOIA-able will always be constantly being FOIA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, on the other end, that's something we can adapt to if uh, information offices across all the states and beyond, you know, have e-discovery systems where they have an AI on the other end of the AI, so we can, uh, be harmonious. Um, and so, you know, all this leads into, you know, in the ideal world, is something like government as a platform, uh, where government moves from being merely, you know, the, the peacock or the people writing reports, but in some sense, sort of like the platform 
for technology that will be doing that automatically. Um, and so like Uber and Lyft are an example of this in Metro where you know, taxi regulation as recently as, as you know, 2014, 2015 was, was governed by taxi commissions, by public sector licensed institutions. And in a five year period, at least in New York City, that flipped from 90 to 10 to 10 to 90. So now, um, you know, the de facto governance, the de facto regulation of ride hailing is done through private platforms competing and using AI and uh, auctions and uh, reputation mechanisms and these, these automated systems to do a better job at regulating. You know, I, I, can, I can remember in 2012 or, 20, or 2014 or whatever where people were still nervous about riding with a stranger and now we, we, we don't even remember that being an issue and that's, that's because these reputation mechanisms are, 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 are very powerful. And now Uber's actually using AI, to, uh, uh, exploring the use of AI to actually predict when you want to hail a ride. So before you actually hit hail a ride, the car may already be on its way uh, and they'll be, they'll be using your, your personal habits. Um, so now imagine, you know, what this could mean for, you know, the USDA or the FDA or any other agency that has a large regulatory uh, mission, you know, do we, Will we be sending USDA inspectors to, to look at the commercial farm, or will all the commercial farms have cameras that are constantly being fed into uh, multimodal models that are analyzing for you know animal abuse or something like that, um, generating reports automatically and using reputation mechanisms to keep people honest? So this is sort of like the data model. Like what what, what is at stake? And what, what makes me very nervous is not AI killing us all, but us not keeping up in the arms race. Because um, at every time we've had a major transformational technology from agriculture to the printing press to the industrial revolution, this preceded a, uh, a effective regime change in how we actually run our institutions. So with the printing press, it was, you know, cross information, and the civil war, the end of feudalism, the rise of the nation state. Uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we went from sort of the laissez-faire, classical liberal era of the 1800s into an era where we have administrative bureaucracies, social security, things that we needed to adapt to the new complexity of industrial society. And, you know, in, in micro, the 90s IT boom drove a wave of new government reforms. Um, and now the internet, uh, in weaker states, you know, the internet contributed to actual state collapse in the case of the Earth's rim. Um, and Countries like China have responded to that by, by basically building a digital surveillance state to, to control the population. So AI opens up different futures. And in political science, there's this concept of that liberal democracy exists within this narrow corridor where state and society have to be maintained in some kind of balance. Um, if, if society gets too strong, you can veer off into a kind of anarchy. And if the state gets too strong in China, you can veer off into a kind of uh, Deputism. Uh, and so, you know, the, the synthesis is not uh, either or, it's actually to find ways of, of using AI to enhance state capacity, but in a way that protects civil liberties and protects our rights, um, protects our, our privacy and so forth. In other words, to build a kind of a constrained leviathan. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is my mental model of where we're at. We need to, we need to get to Estonia, the country with the most, most advanced government in the world, fortified against Russian cyber attacks. You know, everything is cryptographically secure. When your kid is born, they're automatically enrolled in school five years later because the, the system knows that uh, at the clock, you know, when they should be going to school. Um, that's where we need to get to really quickly. <laughs> um, and, uh, the, and, and, and hopefully avoid tipping over into either of the other um, sort of civil unrest on the one hand or uh, sort of overreaction and the building of, of uh, surveillance.